Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. So it's the same principle as making a string instrument, but it involves uh, moving, uh, moving mechanisms. What Cajuns did to bring back the accordion. Because sales tax is the only thing that generates immediate money that they can bank on having in a fiscal year. Lawmakers voted for budget stability, but where's the reform? There ain't no wrong way to do the right thing. When the right thing comes along, do it. Finding funding for Bossier Parish schools. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment, but right now on this week's edition of SWI, a look at some of the other week's top headlines. There are three judges with Louisiana ties on President Trump's shortlist to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Judge Amy Coney Barrett is a New Orleans native. She's a 46-year-old practicing Catholic who attended Dominican High School before leaving the state for college. Judge William Pryor graduated from then Northeast Louisiana University and Tulane Law. He was the Attorney General of Alabama who prosecuted then-Judge Roy Moore for disobeying a federal order to remove a statue of the Ten Commandments from in front of a courthouse. Judge Don Willett is also on the short list. Stationed in Austin, Texas, he serves on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, based in New Orleans. This past Saturday night in Monroe, Holly Conway won the crown of Miss Louisiana 2018 and will move on to compete in the newly revamped Miss America competition in Atlantic City this fall. Her father, Hollis Conway, is an LPB Louisiana legend. He gained fame in track and field as a high jumper and won two Olympic medals after starring at then USL. Holly also competed in track and considers herself more of an athlete than a pageant girl. Louisiana slipped from 48th to 49th in an annual national assessment of child well-being that looks at poverty, education, and health. The Annie E. Casey Foundation, a private research and policy firm, released the Kids Count Report. Our state was 49th overall, but 50th in measures of economic well-being. The report says 314,000 Louisiana children live in poverty and 393,000 are in households where parents lack secure employment. The Bayou Bridge Pipeline is on schedule for a finish date by October if a federal appeals court does not interrupt the work. Bayou Bridge attorneys say in a court filing that construction of the 163-mile pipeline is nearly 75 percent complete. A three-judge panel of the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals is considering whether the company can continue building the pipeline through the environmentally fragile Atchafalaya Basin Swamp. <laughs> President Trump's trade war could slow Louisiana economic output by 7 percent over five years, more than any other state, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. One in six jobs in our state of 4.7 million is tied to international commerce and would be at risk, threatening an unemployment rate the U.S. Department of Labor pegs at an all-time low. It would especially hurt farmers and oil industry refiners. Bossier City Schools have much to be proud of. An endowment established more than three decades ago has grown more than anyone thought possible. LPB joins city, civic, and school leaders to mark the milestone. And while there, we learned the backstory that helped make it all possible. You know, there's no saying in North Louisiana, there ain't no wrong way to do the right thing. When the right thing comes along, do it. The right thing Foster Campbell thought was to build an endowment fund for schools in his native Bossier Parish. It was a dream of his. In 1985, he had moved from teaching school to a role as state senator, and he saw a need. I'm living in Bossier Parish. My folks lived here since the 30s. 
30s. Nobody's ever done this in this parish. Nobody's ever done this in North Louisiana. And I did it with a lot of good help with a lot of friends. One of those friends was then Governor Edwin Edwards. The quick-witted Edwards was one of many attending this week's milestone event. All my life, political life, I thought that government should be, first priority should be the health of people and education of our children. Because when you give people health, it makes it possible for them to be able to do things. You give them education and it always lasts. Foster, what you and these people have done will bear dividends for many more generations. Money from Louisiana Downs, a big deal by the mid-1980s, began the fund. The racetrack was the place to be then, drawing huge crowds from many surrounding states. Because they were already sharing some of their earnings with the city and police jury in Bossier, Campbell thought, why not the schools? So he went to Edwards. Edwards was pro-education. He said, uh, yeah, I'll do it. I'll give you half a million a year. He's the one who named it beef. That was the era when Wendy's hamburgers popularized the phrase, where's the beef, in their TV spots. So those words were ingrained in American pop culture. Edwards parlayed that popularity along with another side item the acronym offered. And I said, well, let's make it uh, Bolger Educational Excellence Fund. Now, it didn't bother me that the two, first, the two initials in the middle of EE, but <laughs> I would have had, had suggested it anyhow. And the money goes strictly into the classroom? There's no football, no basketball, no baseball, no artificial tracks or, or astroturf. Uh, you can't spend the money for salaries, and you can't build buildings with it. So it's unique like that. This money has to go in the classroom. That's where it ought to go, uh, and it helps uh, tremendously. Through the years, the fund has helped provide 100,000 hours of tutoring sessions, advanced music labs, a television production studio, expanded art instruction, 1,500 computers, and 40 digital smart boards for teachers. The advent of casinos in Bossier Parish now fuels the funding for beef, and the proof is in that 50 plus million dollar endowment. Now Bossier Parish is the fastest growing, if it's not the fastest, it's one of the fastest growing parishes in Louisiana. Uh, the public schools here are great, great. And people are moving here, uh, and the schools uh, is one of the main reasons they're moving here, because kids can get a good quality education, and with a fund like this, uh, there's nothing we can't do with uh, modern technology. We have the money to buy it and bring it to the students. $50 million is, a, is the most uh, anybody's got in the state for, for sure. And I don't know if there's a parish or county in the United States that has $50 million. And it's growing uh, for an endowment fund for their school. Billy Joe Brotherton is a former teacher in the parish. She's now president of the Bossier School Board and says the fund helps make her current job easier. The fact that you have this fund gives Bossier schools a leg up on other schools in the state? Technology, uh, we got some things uh, that we wouldn't have been able to get without that uh, money. So the beef money definitely helps in education. There are so many things that we need to do in Bossier Parish and, or any parish. And um, just having that money to, to lean back on has really helped over the years. Thanks to Foster and his insight of what, you know, of how good this could help us, um, we have been able to, I think, move above a lot of parishes in things that we can offer and um, things that we wouldn't have been able to do at all. And you use beef as a model for the statewide fund that exists. People would say, well, I know what you did for Bossier, but what did you do for Webster? And what did you do for Bienville and Red River and East Baton Rouge and West Baton Rouge? What are you going to do about that? In 1998, Louisiana and 45 other states entered into a settlement with tobacco companies and established funds for health care and education. Beef was certainly a precursor to this statewide fund, known as EIF, the Educational Excellence Fund. Like beef, annually, only the fund's earnings are spent, sending about $15 million a year to classrooms around the state. Now, while canvassing Greater Shreveport, we stopped in to talk with Liz Swain. She heads up the Downtown Development District in Shreveport. Her office is housed in a hip, 
repurposed building, and she says downtown Shreveport is ripe with similar structures. It has investors coming in and taking the old and converting them into condos, apartments, and office space. Shreveport also has a wealth of historic buildings and does not seem to be defined by the number of service parking lots which stretch throughout downtown Baton Rouge. We have developers from all over the country who are buying these incredible historic buildings and are doing what's called adaptive reuse. They're taking an old building that used to be an old bank or a shoe shop or whatever and making it into something wonderful for today's use. And in many cases, that is living. As we did in the building that we're in right now, it's a great old building, about 100 years old. It used to be a battery shop, and then for a while it was a storage facility, and then for a while you parked cars in here, and now it's a wonderful, trendy office space. And we were able to do it with the help of historic tax credits given by the state of Louisiana. If it were not for the state historic tax credit, which is the biggest tool in our tool belt in Shreveport, in downtown for our historic buildings, we would not see nearly the rehab, the buildings coming back on tax rolls, the buildings being rehabilitated for all kinds of great uses. It has been a wonderful incentive. We have been talking about the legislature every week on this show since mid-February. What did those four sessions amount to? LPB's Kelly Spires is here to tell us all about it. Kelly. Thank you, Andre. I sat down with veteran Associated Press reporter Melinda DeLott to talk about what got done what, and the tax reform we were promised but didn't happen. So what came of the third special session? Well, I mean, they officially ended the fiscal cliff discussion. They passed the sales tax renewal bill, which renews a 0.45% sales tax of the expiring 1%. They raised uh, $463 million for the budget that starts in July. So that was enough money to stop cuts to tops to college campuses, to make sure healthcare programs were protected, pretty much everything stays on a fairly even keel with, without very damaging cuts to anything. So they accomplished, they accomplished the big goal, which is balance the budget. So crisis averted. Correct. At the beginning of this term, there was a lot of talk about tax reform, getting rid of exemptions, broadening the base, lowering the rate. Where do we stand on all of that? Well, none of that happened. <laughs> At the end, they pushed themselves so close to crisis and so close to damaging cuts, or at least what most people seem to agree would be damaging cuts. But they pushed themselves so close to that, that really all they were left with was a sales tax, because sales tax is the only thing that generates immediate money that they can bank on having in a fiscal year. So um, all of the talk of tax reform, they talked about it a lot. People filed bills, but the House Republican leadership and the governor's office did not agree on what tax reform would look like, and the House Republican leadership uh, pretty much blocked any bill last year that was pegged to the notion of tax reform. So it, it's a conversation for another day. There are a lot of different ways that the state collects taxes, you know, from income, from sales, from inventory tax, lots of different things. Sales tax in particular might have some momentum behind it, given the Supreme Court decision about internet sales tax? Um, is there any appetite for massaging some of the sales tax detail minutia in 2019, given that it's, it's a fiscal session? Well, I mean, I think you'll see a lot of people come forward with ideas because it's a fiscal session. But I question if they're really going to do anything substantive in an election year. 2019 is a big election year. All the legislative seats are up. The governor's race is going to be happening. All the statewide elected officials are up. I just question if anybody's going to really want to rejigger anything major when they're all going on a ballot to run for something, presumably. And also they've been fighting about this for three years running, so maybe everybody wants to take a breather. I think people will actually file some legislation. I'm just skeptical about whether I think there will be a lot of momentum behind it. When the governor was asked about tax reform, he said he still wants to pursue it. But when reporters pressed him on a timeline or how he would approach it, he was very squishy on, on kind of what the broader parameters would be of what he was going to be interested in. Right. We've already talked about this for three years. And there's a task force report that outlined all the ways that you could make a tax structure 
fairer, more in line with other states, and, and just generally what is considered better tax policy um, from tax economists and fiscal experts. And they have all that, and they did nothing with it. So I guess I'm looking for what lawmakers got out of the last three years. You know, we had a lot of discussion about this stuff, and, and we ended up doing what we needed to to prevent the budget cliff, but what did we learn over the past three years? I'm not sure, honestly. I mean, I, I think people have very differing views about what tax reform means to them. I think some people see it as a way to just improve the tax structure, whatever that means in their mind. Some of them see it as a way um, to rewrite the tax code, maybe to lessen taxes on people. Other people see it as a way to raise revenue, perhaps. And, and there are so many competing visions of what tax reform should look like. And things are, are so partisan and fractious right now in the House that, that I'm not really sure I know what they got out of three years, except a lot of frustration, a lot of angst, and a lot of irritation with each other. Conversations about tax reform are going to continue. I just, I think uh, 2021 might be a more realistic year when people will have um, spent a little more time on it and they won't be in the crush of an election cycle. And, and so perhaps by giving themselves some, some financial stability and with the online sales tax revenue that may be coming in, although we don't really yet know how much that could be, that could give them a little bit more space to have a conversation about um, what the state's tax structure should look like long term. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, did you know that June is National Accordion Awareness Month? If you've listened to Louisiana music, you probably have an inkling of how important the accordion is to Cajun culture. But did you know how important the Cajuns have been in the history of the instrument itself? Kelly took a dive into LPB's archives to find out more about this, and what did you learn? Well, Andre, after World War II, it became difficult to find new German accordions or replacement parts in America. By the mid-1950s, some Cajuns found a way to hand make replacement parts and how to build their own accordions, helping bring back the instrument to Acadiana. Mark Savoy was, of Eunice was one of them. LPB profiled Savoy in 1981. I started playing Cajun music when I was 12 years old. And uh, ever since I can remember, my father loved Cajun music. And ever since I can remember, he'd have these uh, neighbors of ours. I lived in a neighborhood where out in the country where all our neighbors were musicians, accordions and fiddle players. And every Christmas and every once in a while, he'd invite these old men to come out to the house and play music. And when these people would come, even if there was other kids, I didn't want to have nothing to do with the other kids. All I'd do is sit down and watch these guys play music. I just loved it so much. I'd leave home and I'd, I'd keep hearing these tunes in my, in my mind. And uh, when I was even younger than that, one day my father brought me to his father's house. Uh, in fact, the house that I live in now, to, his, to my grandfather's father's house. And uh, he told his father, he said, Daddy, he said, go and uh, get your fiddle and play us a tune. So my grandfather went in the back room and brought out a box. And I had never seen a violin before, no, no kind of musical instrument before, before this day. So he brings out this wooden black box and he sits down and he opens it up very slowly, gets a little wooden contraption out with some strings on it and plucks the strings a while and fools around with it. Then he leans back in his chair and starts playing a real pretty tune. And I made up my mind right then and there. I said, well, I don't know what he's doing, but when I get to be older, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to make the same kind of sounds and I want to be what he is. I want to be a, a person who can make those sounds on that instrument. How to make an accordion. Uh, there's a kid that came once, I had a booth set up, uh, a display of parts in New Orleans, and he came up to me, he said, uh, what is this, a kit? Well, I said, if, if you call going out in the uh, swamps and cutting a maple tree down, I said, and uh, making 532 pieces out of it, I said, I guess you call it a kit. Uh, making accordions is something that starts out with me by going out in the forest and uh, finding a, a tree that looks nice. And uh, because I use uh, maple, figured maple, uh, curly maple, and believe it or not, there's a lot of that here in Louisiana. Real figured wood like this over here. And uh, I cut the tree down, 
age the wood for about six years and uh, fabricate all the parts. There's, uh, unlike most musical instruments, I mean, this is the same principle of make, making a record as anything else, but unlike other uh, string instruments, this has moving parts. It has a moving keyboard, uh, which has to be very precise working with wood. It has a moving part on this side, and also a moving part on the left-hand side, the bass accompaniment. Over here, this is all moving parts, and also the voice changes are the stops, the stop assembly. All of this is moving parts over here also. So it's the same principle as making a string instrument, but it involves uh, moving, uh, moving mechanisms. There's uh, 532 pieces that goes into my instruments, and the only thing that I don't fabricate in this shop are the steel reeds, the part that, actual, that makes the actual uh, vibrations when the wind hits it, like this here. This is the only thing that I don't fabricate. I used to make the, uh, the bellows, which is uh, this part here. This was made out of a, a variety of items, like ranging from tablecloths and uh, nylon material to anything else you could find laying around the kitchen. But now I, get, I have a source of these where uh, I import them from, uh, from Italy. Also, the reeds come from Italy. Uh, the way that an accordion works, it's uh, like I mentioned before, it's just the action of the bellows, pumping the bellows, causing air flowing through uh, reed mounts and making the reeds vibrate when the, when the air hits them, the air pressure. Is it to get the sound out of, how light is it to get the sound out of the instrument, not the actual mass? I played Cajun music and I listened to Cajun records because I loved it. To me, Cajun music uh, represents uh, an early part of my childhood, a very warm, uh, tight family scene, uh, friends coming over to my, my parents' home, playing music and having a good time and uh, a, a loving uh, family, close family ties. The common belief is that German immigrants brought accordions to Acadiana, but it may be that African American musicians deserve credit for popularizing them. According to the Department of Culture, Recreation and Tourism, many of the first records of accordions in Louisiana are in the hands of black musicians. Kelly, interesting. Thanks so much for that. We appreciate it. And you can find more information and more history online with LPB's Louisiana Digital Media Archives at ladigitalmedia.org. The largest freshwater lake in Louisiana is actually a river, and it took a lawsuit to actually decide that. The court case is under appeal that parts of Catahoula Lake is off limits for fishing and duck hunting. The clash of private property rights versus sportsmen's access to waterways is one of the issues debated on this month's Louisiana Public Square. Here's an excerpt. What do you see as some of the challenges for Louisiana's coastal fishermen and coastal duck hunters, whether it be from a land access standpoint or from a habitat standpoint. Being in the coastal region and doing what I do, charter fishing for a living, I mean, our biggest problem that we have on the coast is access to our water. I mean, our access gets thrown off every day. We're getting thrown out of places that we get, we go been fishing 25, 30 years, and then all of a sudden now they come in and they tell us we can't go there. I mean, who do we know who they really are, to be honest with you, but I mean, we're on the public's water. I mean, we're not on the land, we're on the water. Places that we've been tra traveling for the last 30 years. Um, so that's really the, our biggest issue is access to our waterways in the coastal areas. And Rudy, Rudy Sparks, you're here from the Louisiana Landowners Association. Why do you feel like these conflicts have arisen over the last uh, five or six years where we didn't have so many uh, before? Well, I think part of it is that we're seeing a constant change in the terrain and in the habitat. And so that creates some questions in some people's mind as to where does the private land stop and where does the public land start. And I think in many cases over the years, landowners have been willing to allow fishermen greater access to their properties and some of their private canals, but for a number of reasons. Uh, particularly the fact that we're really struggling in trying to preserve our coastal marshes. They're so fragile, they're being de eroded, subsided, and a lot of damage is caused when some of these boats get into these interior marshes and begin to churn the waters. And, and so as landowners and land managers who are hired by these landowners, we have a responsibility to protect those resources and those assets that those land 
lands have. And so I think that's part of it. There's a lot of concern about that and the, and the potential deterioration that's caused to these marshes as a result of these fishing activities. I, I want to know what are we going to do about the feral hogs? Mr. We're, Secretary? We're working with the Department of Agriculture uh, very closely. They're looking at biological uh, 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 projects that, that, that they're uh, looking at for sterilization. They're looking at all kinds of, uh, 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 and, and they're doing research right now to, to, for different kinds of feedstock where they could feed these animals to, to get rid of them. The biggest problem we've had is, is warfarin was, was the first initial product that came out to get rid of the hogs, but the, but the, the uh, collateral damage that would have occurred is far worse than what the, where the hogs are at today. I think, uh, you know, with the research going on right now, I, I believe within the next year or two we're going to have some biological uh, answer to, to the problem that we have with feral hogs. Uh, certainly they're, they're, they're a horrible problem and, and a lot of the, the problem we're having with deer population and, and the habitat for deer is, is responsible. The responsibility comes from the feral hog. Uh, destruction of, of that habitat, uh, habitat. So uh, that we are working with uh, agencies. We're working with LSU. We're working with the Department of Agriculture. There are some national uh, uh, companies that are working and, and looking at some uh, alternative uh, resources that we may be able to apply uh, to, uh, to get rid of these hogs. So, so there is a lot of work taking place. You know, uh, I wish I could snap my fingers and they could go away. But uh, it's not like we're not doing anything, and we do realize the importance of, of that issue and what effects it has on the rest of the landscape within Louisiana. A reminder, you can see an encore broadcast of Louisiana Sportsman's Paradise or Problem Sunday at 11 a.m. on LPB. Visit lpb.org slash public square for more information. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, with support from viewers like you.